Okay, so if you have your Bibles, I'd invite you to turn to 2 Samuel 24. 2 Samuel 24. We looked at, we were in 1 Samuel last week. We'll be in 2 Samuel this week. And we will read through our passage uh, today as we, as we kind of work through it together. As we focus on King David as an intercessor. King David as an intercessor. Um, I think I've shared this with you all before, but uh, one of the things that just kind of... Um, when I played football growing up, one of the things that just made me uh, the most upset was whenever somebody on the team or somebody within my position unit, I was a lineman, so one of the linemen, messed up. Not just they didn't do their assignment right, but they did something wrong uh, of more of a moral quality. Uh, maybe they show up late. Maybe they, uh, I don't know, said a bad word. <laughs> somebody, maybe they got in a fight. And the whole unit had to had to run because they messed up. Now that just made me, I hated it, right? Oftentimes, if you were late, you just had to run hills by yourself, but sometimes the whole team would have to participate in the punishment. And I just always felt that there was something wrong about that. It made me so sad, but, but truth be told, the thing that I hated even more than that was whenever I did something wrong and everyone else had to join in my punishment with me. That uh, It's one thing to feel bad when it's being applied to you. It's another thing to feel bad whenever you're the cause of someone else's ire and suffering. Well, uh, you know, one of the one of those punishments we do, you know, is you know, if you if you messed up, you had to run gassers. Well, a gasser was uh, just kind of like four quick sprints down and back. You'd have to go, uh, and then you could breathe, but you couldn't really breathe, and you couldn't really catch your breath before you had to run the next gasser. Uh, hence the name. You are gassed whenever it's done uh, at the end of practice. Again, those days are behind me. That's over half my lifetime ago, so we can, you know, not be too anxious about it. But in on seriousness, as we, one of the things, I bring that scenario up because we actually see kind of both of those scenarios taking place in our passage today with David and the people of Israel. Uh, the situation we face today as we continue our study of intercession is quite different from the other situations we faced before because David, who is the intercessor we're looking at, is actually himself implicated in the very sin that he has to intercede for for Israel. So I want us to see that. So the first thing I want us to do is to read just uh, 2 Samuel 24, verses 1 through 10. Uh, actually, 1 through 9. 2 Samuel 24, verses 1 through 9. It says again, The anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he incited David against them, saying, Go number Israel and Judah. So the king said to Joab, the commander of the army who was with him, Go through all the tribes of Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, that's basically from the north to the south, and number the people, that I may know uh, that I may know the number of the people. But Joab said to the king, May the Lord your God add to the people a hundred times as many as they are, while the eyes of the king, the Lord, my lord the king, should still see it. But why does my lord the king delight in this thing? But the king's word prevailed against Joab and the commanders of the army. So Joab and the commanders of the army went out from the presence of the kingdom to number the people of Israel. They crossed the Jordan and they began from Aror, and from the city that is in the middle of the valley, towards Gad and on to Jazir. They came to Gilead, to Kadesh, in the land of the Hittites. They came to Dan. From Dan they went around to Sidon, that's on the coast. And they came to the fortress of Tyre, and to all the cities of the Hivites and the Canaanites. And they went out to the Negev of Judah at Beersheba, again in the south. So when they'd gone through all the land, they came to Jerusalem at the end of nine months and 20 days. It takes a long time. Uh, I mean, it takes us a year to do a census, and that's with, you know, modern technology. If you have to do a head count, it takes a lot longer. Uh, nine months and 20 days, and Joab gave the sum of the numbering of the people to the king. In Israel, there were 800,000 valiant men, who drew the sword, and the men of Judah were 500,000. Um, hold on just a second. I've been asked to mute some of the lines, so I'm going to mute a couple of y'all just to make sure there's no feedback. Okay. All right. Um, so there, there, we have a very interesting scenario here. This is the last chapter in the book of 2 Samuel, and initially 1 and 2 Samuel were really one kind of book, two parts, but one continuous narrative. And so it's, it's the last thing that happens. And so you just think of everything that David has accomplished as the king. You know, like he 
killed before he was the king he killed David and Goliath and then he becomes the king and you know the, brings the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem and he uh, you know God makes a covenant with him in 2 Samuel 7 2 Samuel 11 is whenever he commits sin against Bathsheba and then really for the next nine chapters or so we see just kind of the negative ramifications that that sin has on David in the present and then in the years that follow that and then chapters 21 to 24 are kind of a long conclusion to the book. And again, we end on this story. Like of all the things that we know about David, we end on this story about this almost very dangerous judgment. And verse 1 starts off with an interesting word. It just says, again, the Lord's anger was kindled against Israel. We're not told why. We're not told what Israel did. We're not as a nation to invoke his ire, but... His, his wrath was kindled against Israel. It's God. We can assume his wrath is just because it is. But it's interesting. It says, and then he, that is the Lord, incited David against them. Go and number Israel and Judah. What complicates this even further is whenever we read about this in 1 Chronicles chapter 21, because, you know, there's some parallel books, you know, 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Kings, and 1st, 2nd Chronicles, they kind of run parallel to each other different authors, different goals, but that's what they're doing. Second, First Chronicles 21 tells us that it says, and Satan stood against Israel and incited David to number Israel. So we already have to answer, like, who was it? Was it, did God do this? Did Satan do it? Or if Satan did it, did God tell Satan to do it? Why? You know what? We don't, one of the struggling things is we don't have all the answers. James 1 13 even tells us, Let no one say when he's tempted, I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he's lured and enticed by his own desire. The desire, when he's conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's fully grown, gives birth to death. So to 2 Samuel, you know, like if we have, looking at two pieces of data in the Bible, do these contradict each other? Well, I, I don't know if there's a, a neat way to resolve this, but I think we can say, well, David, there, there was something going on in David's heart, right? So God incited David to do this, but David is a part of the people of Israel. And I don't, again, we don't know what the sin is, but he is implicated in what they have done. And then we see his pride do this. Whenever he's incited to do a census, he takes the bait. We've seen there are times whenever God tells the prophet about judgment. He tells Abraham, he tells Moses, he tells Samuel that judgment is coming and then those prophets have a chance to pray and receive God's mercy. Well, here, David is presented with an opportunity. He's actually given two chances to turn it away, right? One is, you know, to count Israel, he could say no. But also Joab, his commander, his general, who is like, Joab is like a really bad character in 2 Samuel. Like, he, he is not, or, yeah, I'm thinking first thing. He is not a good guy. He is like David's hitman. So if David has an issue... Joab's the guy who'll take care of that issue. You know, you think of like the Godfather or something like that. Even if even if David doesn't give him commands, Joab will make sure that it's all squeaky clean. But Joab even confronts David and says, "Are you sure you want to do this thing? You know, may God give you a hundred times that what are they there? But why do this? He can tell there's something wrong." And David still indulges in this sin. He engages it, and so, so we have to wonder, like, you know, what's going on there? It's it's, it's always difficult, but also. What's wrong with what David wanted to do? I think that's what we might wonder. You know, we're thinking like the Ten Commandments, and we're like, you know, thou shalt not have another God, thou shalt not commit idolatry, thou shalt not take the Lord's name in vain, thou shalt honor the Sabbath and keep it holy, honor your father and your mother, don't murder, don't steal, don't lie, don't commit adultery, and don't covet. You know, like, well, what did, you know, did David do any of those things or anything related to those things? Well, we're not told explicitly what was wrong with the census, but we do have some clues, okay? And, and one... Uh, is that uh, just knowing a little bit about ancient, ancient and modern societies, why do you do a census? You do a census two main reasons. One would be to assess a, a population for taxation, right? So if the population is growing, I'm going to charge it a heavier tax. I know how much I can milk it for if I'm the king. Uh, David, he's the first, he's the second king of the, what we call the united monarchy, where all of Israel is united under one king. Uh, but his kingdom was very big and had other peoples who lived within that kingdom. It wasn't just Israelites, but it was others, and even though he counts the Israelites. So we know that, but also we're told like the people who are counted are valiant men. They're soldiers. 
So one thing you do for a census is you're seeing your military might. I do think one of the things that's interesting about the geography of this head count is that it's like at already the peak of David's kingdom. So again, I mentioned if you like look on a map it, where it says all the places that David conquers, it's a pretty expansive territory. And this is like going to all those expanses. So it's not like, you know, David is just huddled in Jerusalem and he wants to expand outward, but to take the whole land of Canaan, it's already a bigger area. So I think there's some boasting here. David wants to assess his own military might later in life. Also, you could see the census as a way to count people so you could who might you might conscript into forced labor to serve uh, the king's purposes. So again, at the very least, we know that there's a pride issue here. David is trying to assess his own might whenever I, he was supposed to trust God. So again, what what was the sin here? That's that's the sin. And without prompting that we're told, at least in Samuel, David actually comes to. And this is the next thing I want us to look at is David's own contrition. So he is kind of a part of, of Israel's judgment. Israel was judged and David got involved. Well, then David will be judged and it affects all of Israel. So it's kind of the, both of the scenarios I said earlier, you know, you have to pay for someone else's sin and then they might have to pay for your sin. They're Especially as the king of the nation, he had a covenantal position with the nation, and so it was important there. But we see his contrition. So at verse 10, he snaps too, and he says, uh, let's read verses 10 to 16. We can kind of see what happens. David's heart struck him after he numbered the people. And David said to the Lord, he said to Yahweh, I've sinned greatly in what I've done. But now, O Lord, please take away the iniquity of your servant, for I've done very foolishly. And when David arose in the morning, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Gad. David's seer, saying, Go and say to David, Thus says the Lord, Three things I offer you. Choose one of them, that I may do it to you. So Gad came to David and told him and said to him, Shall three years of famine come over your land? Or will you flee three months before your foes while they pursue you? Or shall there be three days pestilence in your land? Now consider and decide what answer I shall return to him who sent me. Then David said to Gad, I am in great distress. Let us fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercy is great. But let me not fall into the hand of man. So the Lord sent a pestilence on Israel in the morning until their appointed time. And there died of the people from Dan to Beersheba 70,000 men. And when the angel stretched out his hand toward Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord relented from the calamity and said to the angel who was working destruction among the people, It is enough. Now stay your hand. And the angel of the Lord was by the threshing floor of Arana the Jebusite. So David realizes his error. And again, one of the great things about David, what sets David apart from Saul, what sets David apart from Solomon, what sets David apart from many, if not most, of definitely most, of all the other kings, is that David, although he was a sinner, he was a man after God's own heart. Sometimes he was pretty obtuse. Right? If you read First Samuel or Second Samuel 11 and following, you see a lot of his obtuse decisions. And again, obtuse is a generous term on some of those. But whenever he realizes his sin, he repents. It's almost like Abraham, you know, think about Genesis and Abraham. Like God gives him a promise and, you know, he initially agrees, but then he has several lapses along the way until this, you know, moment of testing in Genesis 22 and his faith holds the day. He's assured of God's promises. It's almost like now David, towards the end of his life, his heart is softened. He's sinned and has experienced forgiveness, right? Especially if we think of the sin of Bathsheba and then just the resulting devastation upon his family. He's sinned and he's suffered and he's more tender. So he, he, he confesses his sin, his iniquity um, before the Lord. Again, he even uses the language, right? I've sinned greatly and what I've done. But now, O oh Lord, please take away the iniquity of your servant, for I've done very foolishly. He knows that he needs God to take it away. I also think it's instructive to see that God, it says that David's heart struck him. He was stricken in his heart. I think the heart here is actually a very important term, right? We're not talking about his, you know, cardiology. We're talking about the fact that in his soul and who he was, he was sensitive to God's law, he was sensitive to God's instruction, and that led him into just, you know, again, it made his conscience alert. 
right? If, if, if you've studied ethics, if you've studied God's commands, then you're going to be convicted when you sin, right? If I read something about do not defraud your neighbor and then I realize that I've been defrauding my neighbor, well, I'm going to feel guilty about that, right? It's especially if I've been told about that. So he, he confesses his own sin. You know, from Psalm 51, we know that he thinks his sin is primarily against God, against you and you only have I sinned and done what is, um, done what is wretched in your sight. So he confesses, and I think that's just important, that he realizes his own sin and confesses that to the Lord, and then he takes action on behalf of the people. Right, because then God gives him three options. You can have three years of famine, three months of military pursuit, or three days of pestilence. And just look at how David responds. The first thing he does is he receives God's verdict. Okay, God has, again, he's judging David for sin that David has committed. And David doesn't deny that. There were many other kings who, whenever a prophet delivered a hard word, you know what they did? They just killed the prophet. Kill the prophet, right? Shoot the messenger. David doesn't do that. He accepts the responsibility. And second is he still continues to confess his own transgression. And he he casts himself, I think this is key, on God's mercy. He says, let me not fall into the hand of man. He says, let us fall into the hand of of Yahweh, of the Lord, for his mercy is great. Let us not fall into the hand of man. David has a sense, he has an awareness that although God has pronounced a judgment that God might also be merciful in the midst of that judgment. In fact, we actually see that. So there were three options. Remember, famine, military, you know, harassment, and pestilence. David doesn't actually choose one. He just chooses, he, he, he kind of eliminates one option and lets God decide. Well, the pestilence is what happens. And we're told after actually less than one day happens where the pestilence is affecting the people. Now, 70,000 people died. That is, is, is very tragic. But we see in this moment that God's mercy is triumphing over his justice. And that's what David knew, right? He knew that even though God was a just judge, that his mercy, grace, and covenant loyalty might triumph over that judgment. And so, again, we see that God stops it. And he says, you know, whenever he gets to this threshing floor, he commands the angel who's doing the, the judgment to stop. And he gives David, and, and, and for context geographically, if I can, if I can help you see what, what it is. So David's house was in Jerusalem, which is a, kind of on a, 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 a not very steep hill. We're thinking more, not even as tall as the Appalachian Mountains, okay? So up a hill, there's the city of David right here, and there's a clear area on top, which would be the uh, foundation for the temple. We'll talk about that in a minute. So it's not far from David's own house where this stops. Okay, it stops at Jerusalem. And David goes, and this is where he actually stands in the breach for the people, right? He actually puts himself between the angel and the people, and again, is willing to receive the punishment himself rather than them. So let's let's read the rest of the story and uh, see what happens, starting in verse 17 through the end of the chapter. It says, Then David spoke to the Lord when he saw the angel who was striking the people and said, Behold, I have sinned and I have done wickedly, but these sheep, these people, What have they done? Please let your hand be against me and against my father's house. And Gad came that day to David and said to him, Go, raise up an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Arana the Jebusite. So David went up at Gad's word as the Lord commanded. And when Arana looked down, he saw the king and his servants coming on toward him. And Arana went out and paid homage to the king with the face to the ground. Arana said, Why has my lord the king come to his servant? David said to buy the threshing floor for you in order to build an altar to the Lord, that the plague may be averted from your people. Then Arana said to David, Let the Lord take the king take and offer up what seems good to him. Here are oxen for the burnt offering and the threshing floor, and yokes of oxen for the wood. All this, O king, Arana gives to the king. Arana said to the king, May the Lord your God accept from you. But the king said to Arana, No, but I will buy it from you for a price. I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God that cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. David built there an altar to the Lord and offered offered burnt and peace offerings. So the Lord responded to that plea for the land, and the plague was averted from Israel. So, again, here we see David stand in the breach. The same thing that we see Moses do 
whenever God pronounces his judgment um, upon Israel after the golden calf. You know, I'm going to destroy Israel. Listen, don't, just take me. Don't, if, if you're going to take them, take me too. I don't want to do it. He puts himself between God and the people. And again, we see this as a characteristic move that intercessors do, as they stand between God and the people and intercede and pray. And uh, as he goes to this place, the floor of Arana, the Jebusite, the Jebusite is in Israel. Those were the residents of Jerusalem before David conquered the city in 1 Samuel. Or, no, I think it's actually 2 Samuel 4 or 5. So, you know, there are people who have leased to live there, but David actually has to buy the land from him. Right? It's, it's interesting. He says, I'm not going to sacrifice to the Lord something that costs me nothing. And I think even just from that line, how often do we try to do that? Right? We want a ministry to fit into our life that we feel comfortable with that doesn't cost us a whole lot. Or this happens very frequently. People want to donate to the church their used furniture. They don't want to buy new furniture. Like, I have this couch. I don't, you know, I don't, I'm getting rid of it. I don't want to, you know, send it to the dump and Goodwill won't take it. So maybe the church can have it, right? Sometimes we need couches. I'm not begrudging all the couches we have, but just that's the mindset, right? I'm getting rid of it. Well, maybe the church must use it. Um, Again, that's an offering, not for an atonement sacrifice, but David realizes there's a cost. Right? That's one of the reasons whenever we think about blood sacrifices in the Old Testament, we might wonder why, what's the point? Right? And especially whenever we can go to the, the, market, the supermarket and just buy meat, you know, why do we have to have a bloody sacrifice? We need to understand that that was a costly sacrifice. It shows the severity of sin and how seriously God takes sin. Right? To offer a goat is to offer an animal that you could either use for meat, wool, or milk. Same with the bull. And so these are, and, and they're different offerings based on the severity of one's sin. But David realizes that he's sinned and he needs to have a pardon. He needs atonement. And so he offers a sacrifice. And, 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 and so we see that as a result of his sacrifice, God does pardon the people and he pardons David. He does so at this place. Again, I mentioned that it would be the future side of the temple, but it also had some really other big things happen there in the Old Testament. Genesis chapter 22, we mentioned already where Abraham is told by God to take his son Isaac and sacrifice him on Mount Moriah. Well, 2 Chronicles chapter 3 tells us that that is where Solomon built the temple. It's the same place. 2 Chronicles 2, verse 1, the one of the reasons David built, buys the threshold where he builds an altar is because that would be the future foundation for the temple. So in this place, we already know that sacrifice, one, sacrifice, two, intercession, and three, thanksgiving, are going to take place in the very place where David does this. But what are we to make of David's intercession? I think he's instructive for us in several ways, but one is that when David sinned and he realized his sin had an effect upon others, he repents of his sin. He owns it. So often whenever people sin, they might try to make an excuse, especially if someone calls them out, right? Well, I'm sorry, but you know, that's just how I am. You know, this is what my Myers-Briggs number is. This is my Enneagram, my personality test. This is what it, that's just how I am. And we should never feel guilty for who we are, but we also shouldn't blame our faults on and our legitimate sins on the way that we're built. Right? It it's happens so often whenever an institution, you know, someone charges an institution with wrongdoing today, you know, they, they deny the blame and they try to push the blame off onto someone else or, so often, no one else. It's interesting how many people suffer injustice at the hands of no one as far as as the legal system is concerned. But they hurt, but somebody hurt them, but nobody hurt them. But David owns the sin. He confesses it. He doesn't try to hide around it. Also, I think it's in instructive for us to see that we have here a forgiven sinner who then intercedes for other people. Right? I know some people, I've talked to them, and they don't feel like they're worthy to pray to God. Right? They do something wrong. I, I think I've told this. I had a conversation with someone in high school who you know, she'd done something wrong, and she hadn't read her Bible recently, and that's why she didn't want to go to church, because she felt too bad. Huh? Wait, 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 wait. You mean the place where you're going to hear the gospel proclaimed? You don't want to go there because you feel like you've done something wrong? And again, for all things, she hadn't read her Bible, you know. 
That's a good place to get to restart, go to church where the Bible's going to be read. So we, but we can intercede, right? And even if we're part of the mess, we can ask for God's mercy for ourselves, but also for those who might be receiving the collateral damage. I also think it's important that we think about intercessory prayer in relation to God's wrath. God is a God of wrath. Jonathan Edwards, the Puritan preacher in America, famously preached a sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Normally, you read this as a high school junior or a college student, and they see, see the Puritans, look how bad they were. But we really have to make sure that we don't sever our faith from the moral authority that God has. Right? God is a God of wrath, and it's not because he is capricious, it's not because he's fickle, it's not because he flies off the handle anytime something bad happens. Right? The type of wrath that God has is one that is slow. <laughs> he is slow to anger. He's, remember the word is he's long in the nose. It takes him a while before he acts in his wrath and his anger. But he is judge. He is just because uh, his wrath is a part of his justice, which is also a part of his love. But we can also say, as we say, yes, we are sinners in the hands of an angry God. We can also say, but we are also sinners in the hands of a loving God, of a merciful God who, Romans tells us, did not spare his own son for us, but rather sent his son Jesus Christ to die in order that we might be forgiven and redeemed from our sins. Right? And so we go to the Lord on behalf of our own mercy, but also for the mercy of others. And one other thing, as we look at David's intercessory prayer, we note that his prayer does something that Moses' prayer does, that Samuel's prayer does, and it's this. It does mitigate God's judgment. Now, sometimes it's not a full mitigation, right? Sometimes it just means God's judgment is delayed. Sometimes it means that God doesn't quite do as much as he said he would do initially. And sometimes it's a full pardon. Why it's one and not the other, I don't always know. I, I, I don't know. But the prayer does that. But one thing the prayer does not do for others is take away their sin. David, still a sinful person. Israel, still sinful. But God takes God to take away the sin. And again, God does. The fact that he bears, he carries Israel's sin. Uh, so often, that's whenever we read in the Hebrew, God would forgive them for their sin. It's actually that God would carry their sin. That's the Hebrew language that's saying that he would put it on his shoulders rather than judge them, that he would take it with him, which a holy God doesn't have to do, but a loving holy God does. And again, as we think forward to Jesus, he can remove our sin, which he does in Jesus Christ, as both our sacrificial offering once for all, but also as our great high priest who is our intercessor. Right, maybe I'll have to finish this series up with a series on Hebrews so we can really see how that works out. I don't think I will quite yet, but still, uh, there is some significant theology there. So, next week, we're going to look at David's son Solomon in 1 Kings chapter 8, and notice how he prays a prayer on behalf of the nation. After Solomon, we're going to look at um, the prophets, and uh, Jeremiah most notably, also Amos and Joel, and uh, there might be one other book that we're going to go through. Maybe it's Ezekiel. I, don't, I might drop one of those out. But anyway, uh, we'll be doing that next week. Um, let me say a closing prayer and we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, I thank you for my brothers and sisters in Christ. And again, just for their opportunity to hear from your word. Father, we pray that you would grow us in our faith and our maturity. Help us to grow in our discernment. And help us to grow in our love. That we would intercede for uh, those who we know need your care and intercession. Um, Father, help us to repent of our sin quickly. To confess it. Uh, to get it off of our chest, off of our conscience, uh, and to just embrace the forgiveness that you offer and have offered in Jesus Christ. Uh, would you help us to be your holy people and your ambassadors? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.